I would talk about current developments and future directions of AI for agriculture and environmental sciences. And um, yes, I say AI in, in my title, but actually I will specifically focus on machine learning um, because uh, this makes up a huge part uh, in AI and this is uh, my main research area. And um, so, yeah, in, um, I want to start with an example. So what you can see here is an agriculture field. And I think you, uh, you realize this image. It's the image from the Fino uh, website. And as the robot suggests, um, we want to find out something about the field. So now we can ask us different questions where all of them have a different level of complexity and difficulty. So for example, uh, we can ask uh, ourselves, so what is on the field and how many plants are on the field? This is something we can um, answer uh, quite well at the moment. Um, we could also ask uh, what will be the yield in a specific area, which is a little bit more difficult. Um, even more difficult it will get when you ask how will this plant look like tomorrow? And on top of this, you can even ask, why does it look like this? And to answer all these questions, um, machine learning is really, really helpful. So what you can see here illustrated is the, um, it, I would change the, um, to the laser pointer. Yeah, so what you can see here is the basic uh, machine learning pipeline. So you have some uh, input, which are earth observation, let it be close range camera images or uh, even uh, satellite images. And you have some desired output, what you want to have. And in the middle, you have the machine learning model. And simply put, uh, the machine learning model is a mathematical relationship between the input and the output. And in order to learn this relationship, you need um, domain knowledge. That means you need input-output pairs from which you can derive and estimate this machine learning model. And once uh, such a model is learned, um, you can apply it to different uh, uh, but similar input data and you get your desired output. In the best case, um, you do not have only a simple uh, model output, you also have a scientific outcome, which means you might have some uh, new scientific incomes, uh, insights. Um, and we all know about the advantages of machine learning. It's automated, it's fast, it's objective, it's comprehensive. Um, but today I do not want to talk about the advantages today. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, where we are now. So what is state of the art and what are the future directions? And for this, I want to show you four examples from my group or from groups uh, I work with. And uh, so one example is the uh, detection of grapevine berries, which I consider as a state of the art at the moment. And as a second ex example, I want to uh, show you um, uh, to how you can generate the unseen. So here you can, um, I show you an example uh, how you can generate berries behind leaves, what you can actually not see, or how you can generate the future um, um, appearance of a plant. And as a teaser, these two images uh, do not exist in real life. And as a last example, I will show you how explainable machine learning can help us to, de to derive novel scientific insights. And before I go into these four examples, uh, I want to add two things. So first of all, the timeline I show you here from state of the art to future directions does not necessarily mean a, a task is um, easier or more difficult. It just means that we can define the task in a in, uh, in such a way that we can uh, solve it with our current uh, methods, data, and sensors. And with we, I always my, uh, mean the community. And second thing is I focus on image-based analysis, but I see uh, similar developments all over the machine learning community. And yeah, I want to start with, uh, to show you how to detect objects. So, um, 
this example I show you now, I consider state of the art and in viticulture, as in many other agricultural areas, detecting the number of fruits is important because the number and the size are good indicator for yield. And so from a machine learning point of view, we ask ourselves uh, how to detect a large number of single um, objects in one image. And as you can see here in this image, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, you have small objects, uh, the objects overlap, you have a high number, and also they do not have a distinct color. So they, they have the same color uh, as the leaves have. And so normally, if you would ask a, com uh, a person from computer vision, uh, they would suggest instant segmentation. So instant segmentation is a mix of um, uh, detection where you have bounding boxes of the um, uh, in an image indicating the object and semantic segmentation where each pixel is classified into berry and non-berry. Um, this is very complex and existing algorithms uh, are mostly only designed to detect uh, a few objects uh, in an image and we have hundreds of them. And to get an efficient method, we re reformulated this task into a semantic segmentation task by adding an additional class, uh, edge, which is the contour um, of the berries. So um, for the semantic segmentation, each pixel is now classified into berry, um, background, or the edge of berry, indicated here in this image by different uh, colors. And um, semantic segmentation is something uh, we can solve quite well. Uh, at the moment, uh, this is uh, due to methods such as convolutional neural networks. And convolutional neural networks are, are a method uh, which learn a relationship between an input and the output with a chain of convolutional operations. Among other mathematical operations, but the core is uh, convolutional operations. And convolutions is a specific mathematical operation which extracts distinct spatial information from data. And I would say that um, convolutional neural networks were a game changer in many application areas um, since 2012, uh, when AlexNet, a very famous convolutional neural network, uh, was presented. Uh, so this gives us a lot of opportunities. And uh, here you can see a re uh, result. Um, when you apply a convolutional neural network to our task and you see that the algorithm is uh, able to uh, detect uh, very small berries, but also larger berries, and you uh, see that we can distinguish between the different objects. And we also uh, did a, a comparison between the uh, number of detected berries and the number of reference berries in several images. Uh, one dot here is one image, and uh, if the dot is on the on the dashed line, it's uh, actually the perfect result because uh, the number of detected berries is equal to the uh, number of manually counted reference berries. And um, yeah, you can see that uh, they are slightly over and under estimations, but overall is a quite uh, good result. And in the next part uh, of my talk, I want to show you something about generating the unseen. And as I said before, uh, the number and the size of berries is a good indicator for yield. But as you can see here, this is the actual situation. So we have a lot of leaves in the image. And um, so the berries are covered by leaves and therefore they cannot be counted. And this is a problem. Um, so therefore we started to work on a method to estimate what is likely or most probably behind the leaves. And as a side note, we are not aiming on actually estimating the reference behind the leaves because this is not possible. We just want to know was it, what is most likely behind leaves. And for this, um, so to accomplish this task, we use so-called generative adversarial networks. And generative adversarial networks are another method which I consider as a huge enabler in the sciences. And we can use, we can use them for um, a lot of tasks and, and to solve them. And uh, so let me briefly show you how they work. 
So generative adversarial network consists of a generator G and a discriminator D. So you have two sub networks. And uh, so the, the generator is uh, here illustrated is a sub network, which is able to generate an image without leaves um, given an image with leaves. And so, so you can imagine this at a complex transformation from one domain with occlusions to another domain without occlusion. And this is called uh, image to image translation because you translate from the domain of occluded berries to domain of non-occluded berries. And of course, you need to train this generator. It needs to get really, really strong that you can uh, yeah, have a good uh, and powerful transformation. And in order to uh, learn this generator, we need another part, uh, which is the uh, discriminator. And in principle, the discriminator learns to classify between a generated image and a real image, which exists in real life. So the discriminator always sees the input with the occluded, um, yeah, with the occluded berries, and then either an image which was generated by the generator or a real image, and the discriminator learns to discriminate between these uh, these two. Um, so it says it's either fake or generated, or it's a real image, and because the generator and the discriminator are fighting against each other during the optimization process constantly, the generator gets really, really good. So in the end, the discriminator cannot discriminate anymore if it's a real image or if it's a generated image. And um, the challenge for us is uh, it is very often the case in, in agriculture and environmental sciences is we need to learn a model with a limited amount of data. So let me show you uh, what we did to, um, yeah, to have proper training data because neural networks like to have a lot of data. Um, so first of all, we collected and prepared image pairs we, because we need um, from the uh, domain of occluded images, non-occluded images, we need from both domains, these images, and they need to be paired. So they need to be exactly show the same content with leaves and without leaves. Um, so we collected this in the field and in our first experiments, we observed that color will not increase the accuracy, uh, just the computation time. So we uh, go for grayscale images for our experiments and also for training the model. And also because we want to count the berries afterwards, we want to see the regions and to count them and to get the size. So we use the algorithm which I presented uh, first in my talk um, and use the berry mask as additional input. So we have two channels, the grayscale image here and uh, the berry mask indicating where are berries for both domains. And um, then because we do not have enough data, we added synthetic data, synthetic image pairs. So what we did is we, um, we used uh, images from the um, domain where we have non-occluded um, um, berries and we just put synthetically some leaves over it. So we have additional image pairs and this is uh, gives us a stable training to train a really powerful uh, generator. And to show you some results, uh, so this on the, on the left you can see uh, images with occlusion. In this case, we uh, we have here occlusions and uh, a big leaf um, over the berries. And on the top, uh, on the bottom, you see the berry mass. In the middle is the real scenario, which is pre-existent. And on the right, you see our generated results. So these images do not exist in real life. But what is good here, you can see. Um, the algorithm is able to uh, identify uh, which regions uh, need to be filled with uh, berries. At no point we told the algorithm where occlusions are. So this uh, algorithm um, figured it out on its own. Um, and there are no berries, for example, in the background, which is good. And um, yeah, so this is, I think, a really, really promising result. Of course, there are open questions, but um, this looks quite good. And just to give you some uh, more results, 
Um, here you can see when we compare the actual counting of berries and images. Again, each dot is one image with several berries in it. Here we have the reference uh, images with all berries without occlusions, so also behind the leaves. And uh, this is the prediction from the first um, procedure I showed. Uh, so only the um, when only visible berries were detected. And this is our result. And you can see a clear shift toward uh, towards the um, yeah towards the um, the reference uh, result. And um, yeah, so uh, it's it's just the, the whole procedure is able to uh, get better results and also with this a better uh, yield estimation in the end. And. As an emergent future direction, I want to point out is so-called informed machine learning. So what you saw and what I presented was clearly a data science model. So a data science model uh, uses a lot of data and analyzes the data. But on the other side, there are knowledge-based models. Knowledge-based models use uh, scientific knowledge and uh, build a model on it. And if you combine both models, uh, you get to the area of informed machine learning. And I think this is a promising future direction. And for our case, in the simplest case, would it mean that uh, we integrate prior knowledge about, for example, the size of the berry, or we have knowledge about the structure of uh, berry bunches, uh, so great bunches. Um, we could integrate it to get more robust result and also to get better, more accurate results. So I would point this out as a future direction worth to uh, go for. And um, as another example, um, I would say uh, to generate the unseen is when you use generative adversarial network uh, for the prediction of the plant growth. So you have now a temporal domain. Um, in this example, the general goal is to uh, predict how a plant will, uh, in this case, cauliflower, will de uh, develop in the future. And you can even think of a um, long-term goal, which is a data-driven growth model conditional on environmental factors such as uh, fertilization or temperature, something like this. And the advantage uh, to predict the whole appearance of uh, plant growth or how plant will look like in the future instead of uh, not only uh, some parameters is uh, that you are way more flexible and what you and what you do with the results so it's uh, because it's just like when you would observe a future state with a sensor and as before um, we use a generative adversarial network for this task uh, so we have an early growth stage and we have a later growth stage in our case it was three weeks and uh, for us important was the generator because the generator can be used to uh, for a new image where we want to have the future state, uh, we use the generator to generate a future uh, state, growth stage of this plant. And then afterwards you can apply some method, um, a suitable method, for example, to derive a segmentation of single plants. And with this, you can derive some traits of the plants someone uh, who, uh, is interested in. And to show you some visual results, so this is the input. Um, in the middle, you see uh, the real image. So this is actually how the plant looks like three weeks later. And this is what we could generate it. Uh, um, on the when, you, when you have a look at it, it looks quite good. Um, also the size is, everything is okay. But if you have a, a closer look, for example, the watering pipes is, you can actually see that it's a generated image or sometimes we have also like uh, leaf veins, which are not that reasonable. But overall, uh, it looks uh, quite good and it looks like a real plan. And uh, I do not want to go too much into detail, but um, we compared the segmentation mask in. Um, so pixels of the segmentation mass of real images and what we generated for several weeks. And you can see that um, there's, uh, yeah, we are able to, uh, to get 
to, uh, to capture how much a plant will uh, grow into the future. Of course, the spread is sometimes for, uh, for, for some weeks uh, uh, quite large, but uh, we are working on it and to find out how we can make this result even better. And as an emerging future direction, I want to point out so-called multimodal machine learning, where you do not only rely on images, but also you uh, add environmental factors, for example, the temperature or, so, or so, some information about the weather. And um, when you think about our long-term goal to have a data-driven growth model, we can feed in these environmental factors to influence the generator to um, yeah to generate it in uh, generate as an image depending on um, the given environmental factors. And so, as a last um, part of my talk, I want to show you how explainable machine learning can help us to derive novel scientific insights. So. Quite often when we use machine learning models where there are few chosen characteristics uh, which are desirable, for example, efficiency and accuracy. I showed you a lot of examples for this, where we are focusing on this. But sometimes it's not enough and researchers are also interested in um, understanding why a framework um, made a specific decisions, uh, a specific decision. And for this, there are some other characteristics which are desirable and which can help us uh, in understanding our framework in a better way and to open this black box of a neural network. And here we have uh, transparency, interpretability and explainability. Transparency is when you have access to the model and its components. Most likely you uh, your model is transparent. Uh, so very often we have access to this model. It's uh, this mathematical relationship between input and output. The problem is not the transparency. But the problem is uh, very often the interpretability because it's too complex for us to understand what's going on. So interpretability is when you present some properties of a machine learning model in understandable terms to a human. And when you combine it with domain knowledge, you uh, have explainability. Uh, but uh, you can see it like this, when you have one interpretation, you can have multiple explanation, depending on the domain knowledge, what you integrate. So you explain the interpretable entities. And one specific research area I think is worth to explore is to come up with definitions which are not existent or only vaguely defined so far. Uh, for example, um, we are currently concerned with the, um, with the topic of what uh, wilderness is because there's no technical definition for wilderness so far. And actually it would be really helpful to have such a uh, definition uh, for a worldwide mapping of wilderness, but we cannot map it because at the moment we don't know what to map. Um, so we need to find this out. And one way to approach this is explainable machine learning. And what you can see here is uh, the framework I also showed you in the beginning with a more uh, some more components. So again, you have the input and you have the output and the machine learning model. And now we enforce transparency and interpretability to the model so that we can understand the decision process of the model. And when we add domain knowledge, uh, we can gain explainability. And um, once we derive scientific insights from this, uh, we can here, we can feedback this and to um, enhance or even adjust our current uh, domain knowledge. And so let's come back to our uh, task in, uh, about what is wilderness. And our goal uh, we had uh, was to define wilderness as a land cover class usable for mapping tasks. And um, the challenge is that we have only vaguely defined reference data. And in our case, we had data from the World Database on Protected Areas, VDPA for wilderness. And they say wilderness is protected area and without um, uh, human activity. So here are some examples. Uh, this is a protected area 
And this is, these are non-protected areas and you already see it. It's not an easy task uh, to solve. And we assume that their vague definition about wilderness is actually uh, share similar characteristics um, as a more general uh, definition of wilderness, which we what we want want to find, and to find this out, we had an uh, an idea, and this is uh, a new topic, and is actually the first time I show this results, and so uh, we designed an interpretable convolutional neural network for scene classification. So this is a network where you put in a, a, a scene, a satellite scene. And then uh, this network classifies the scene into wilderness or non-wilderness, depending on the uh, this uh, word database of protected areas definition. And now we want to know why the network thing thinks a scene is uh, wilderness or not. And um, we uh, designed it in a way that there's one region here in, this, uh, in the convolutional neural network, which is interpretable. That means human understandable. And to put it in a very simplified way, uh, this part is of the same size of the image and shows how each region in an image uh, influences the decision process of the network. And when we had a closer look at this, um, we could find out that uh, that we found patterns in the decision process depending on uh, specific image regions. And image regions causing the same pattern in the decision process of the network can be assigned to concepts of wilderness or not. And specifically, we found three concepts. One was for water and man-made uh, structures, one was for forest and some kind of vegetation, and one was for uh, wasteland. And here you see, what you can see here are uh, different satellite um, images and all images which are not gray uh, cause, uh, cause a similar behavior in the decision process um, of the network. And you can even quantify this uh, because if you cover specific regions during the decision process, it will cause a significant change in, uh, in the classification. So as an example, um, in the first row, uh, if you hide these regions here, which are not gray, which are, belong to the concept of water and man-made structure, it will cause that the scenes are much more likely classified as wilderness. So they're very important for non-wilderness. So we um, see this regions connected to non-wilderness. And for a second example, we surprisingly um, uh, found out that forests also and different kind, uh, kinds of vegetation also uh, are connected to non-wilderness. We assume that this is because our data and our data set forest is most likely very close to human um, activity and to urban areas. But uh, we found out that wasteland was uh, slightly connected to wilderness. And um, with these new insights, uh, so our algorithm helped us to, to uh, formulate hypotheses. We can go now back to our data and design more targeted experiments. And in the end, we hopefully can come up with um, a more clear, uh, clear definition what wilderness is and how we can identify wilderness with satellite images in an automatic way. So um, I want to sum up. And my summary is actually more um, from my viewpoint where I think we uh, should go, but I avoided, I avoided the should go. Uh, so I, I'm just saying what we uh, do next. And I showed you this timeline from state of the art uh, to future directions. And you see uh, also where we where are still uh, open research question and, and challenges. I see a major challenge uh, from uh, in the translation from human knowledge to technical formulation. And I see also this as a huge, huge major challenge in Finorop uh, because this is necessary for machine learning. I see a huge potential of combining domain knowledge and uh, machine learning, whether it's um, informed machine learning or it's explainable machine learning. And I especially see explainable machine learning that it can help us to go 
beyond learning already known relationships, it can help us to find out new things. And I haven't talked about uncertainty quantification, but I want to mention it here because I see a huge potential in uncertainty quantification. We are able to uh, quantify data and model uncertainty in neural networks. And I think we should start to uh, use this uh, in our models. And it will help us, especially for making uh, or go when we go to the decision process. And with this, I thank you a lot for your attention and I am happy to take uh, questions.